share my screen here. All right, hopefully that worked. We can see your screen. All right. So my name's Justin Waters. I own All Waters Fly Fishing and Guide Service, as well as All Waters Coffee Company. Um, today, we're going to talk about flies and seasons on Puget Sound and Hood Canal. Um, I have a quick little video here. The audio was working and then it's not working. It's literally a minute long and it doesn't require audio to work. So here we go. This is kind of what we do out there on, on Hood Canal. Yeah, I have no idea if the audio worked for you guys or not. I could hear it, but uh, hopefully you guys could hear it. I don't know. I see Bridget shaking her head no. So <laughs> anyway, so we'll talk about kind of the seasons and how, how the year kind of breaks down for us. Um, we're going to be coming into spring season here shortly. Um, and then obviously you guys know how the year works, so we can... So typically, this is my first time ever doing this presentation on Zoom. So typically I can ask you guys if you guys have fished for sea run cutthroat, but uh, we can't today. Um, but sea run cutthroat, they're a trout just like you catch in the rivers, a cutthroat trout. However, these guys migrate out to the salt water. They feed on the intertidal zones and they are a ton of fun to catch out on the fly. Um, we do light tackle as well, but um, mostly, I think I think the majority of cutthroat caught in Puget Sound is probably on a fly anymore. Um, they are catch and release only, so a lot of the uh, a lot of the marketability is gone for conventional tackle fishing on them. So in the spring, we have, or let me back up a little bit. In the fall, when the salmon, when all the salmon come back, all the chum salmon and the pink salmon come in, and when they spawn, the springtime, all those little baby salmon come back out, and they typically live in the first couple inches of the water column out along the shorelines. Um, typically, we're fishing north of all the creeks. What happens here is all these cutthroat who have just gotten done spawning all of a sudden have a buffet line of feed to feed on, um, which makes them extremely aggressive and makes us have the ability to fish floating lines for about two months and catch fish off the surface. Um, most of the time, these cutthroat are extremely, extremely aggressive and fairly stupid at this time of year, um, meaning you don't have to be super technical. However, because they are feeding in really shallow water, big splashes from flies tend to, uh, tend to spook them away. So typically we're going nine and 10 foot leaders where the rest of the year we can get away with pretty short fat leaders. Um, the kind of the main kind of the main focus this time 
this time of year is looking for fish actually feeding. So if you're just splashing the water and not catching anything from March, April, and May, I would recommend just stopping and look around because if they're there, you'll know it. Um, the cutthroat are, are really, really aggressive. So if they're there, they'll be hitting the surface and you'll see the bait fly out of the water. It's, it's a really fun time of year to be fishing. Um, I'm going to say this whole Zoom thing is very weird because I can't see you guys talking back to me or uh, <laughs> um, I feel like I'm going to fly through this presentation very quickly. So I apologize. Okay. We've got lots of questions, so don't worry. <laughs> that and I have about 150 pounds of coffee sitting behind me, so I talk pretty fast. <laughs> so in the summertime, the summertime is probably I mean, it's definitely our busiest time of year for obvious reasons. People are people are on vacation and everything like that. Hood Canal has become more of a destination for people to vacation out in Washington because it's kind of a, it's quiet and beautiful and there's tons of hiking and fishing and all that to do. Um, but what's what's really cool about the summertime is you don't have to wear 400 layers for one, running out in the boat. And two, you can, pretty much every week see more and more bait come into the sound. Um, the, uh, all, the, all those little tiny salmon are typically leaving at the same time that we're getting anchovies and herring in big numbers back into the, back into the sound. Um, and uh, all the sand lamps are starting to get bigger and you're able to see them. The eelgrass beds are all growing back up. It's a, it's a really, really fun time of year. Um, one of the, one of the coolest things about cutthroat is that as long as you can, as long as you know what they're eating, your flies don't have to be exact replicas, although it's fun to try. Um, what you're really focused on is just the silhouette. So when the cutthroat are, are swimming along and looking up, looking up through the water, if they see something that is three inches in the shape of a sand lance or a herring typically they're going to eat it in the summertime they're they're not a they're not really shy this time of year the one thing we really focus on is finding cold water in the summer um so this kid in this picture i just have to make a quick side note here this kid in this picture with the long hair here his name's carson he started fishing with me when he was nine years old, and now he uh, now he works for us. He's one of our guides now. Um, he just got his captain's license last year, and he's out guiding for us. And when he's not up in Alaska guiding, um, I'm super excited to have him on the team. He uh, he still looks exactly the same twelve year old with really long hair, but you know, um, in the uh, Another, another awesome thing about the summertime that we really enjoy is we cover a ton of water because you have to stay in cold water. So as the day goes on, the water temperature will start to rise, especially on Hood Canal, not as much on the Puget Sound, but on Hood Canal, the water temperature will start to rise. And we might cover, you know, we might cover 10, 15 miles of shoreline just trying to stay in that cold water. Um, and just hit all the deep points and, and drop offs where there's where there's bait. Um, the cutthroat really don't like water temperatures above 65 degrees. And Hood Canal will actually will actually see water temperature in the 80s in the lower Hood Canal, um, which is terribly bad for fishing in case you're wondering. Great for uh great for swimming, but terrible for fishing. The fall time is by far the best time of year to be on the Hood Canal um, or Puget Sound for that matter. September, October, November, we see our biggest fish every year. The fishing, and I don't know if it's because we're getting better at it, which, you know, that's arguable, um, but we are seeing bigger fish every year um, and more of them in a lot of these streams especially as Hood Canal Salmon Enhancement has done a lot of uh, restoration work on a lot of the streams, um, providing shade in a lot of the places. As I was saying, the water temperatures rise quite a bit. 
um, those freshwater streams dumping cold water, I think I think that's made a huge difference. And that's just that's completely not scientific. That's just observation. But um, I do think that's a a big a big deal. Um, some of the big things that we tell people, you know, we get people calling us constantly asking us for tips and stuff on the fishing hood canal. One of the big, one of the big uh, keys to success, I guess, is finding where the salmon are in the fall. Um, the cutthroat will follow the salmon. The salmon are going to follow the bait, and and you're going to get a mixed bag of both when you're fishing for them. There's just no way around it. If you're fishing for cutthroat and there's coho around, you're going to catch them. Um, but one of the best, one of the best methods we found is pretty common sense. I'm going to skip ahead in this presentation and come back really quick. Um, out of curiosity, can you guys see my mouse on the screen? Yes. Okay, cool. I'm going to skip ahead on this presentation really quick and show you a map. Um, all right, so as the, as the fish enter Hood Canal down here, this is Hood Canal right here, um, as they enter Hood Canal, they will cruise the shoreline and everywhere they hit a big turn pretty much is a good spot to fish salmon. Um, anywhere where there's a wall of land where they, where they have to kind of go around it, like this is Misery Point right here. As the salmon come in, they get confused, hang out for a couple days and then move down as they hit, I cannot remember this, Pleasant Harbor area over here. They will hit that big body of land, get confused for a couple days, and then cruise around. All of those spots are tend to be places that the cutthroat will congregate, um, and that's a uh, that's a huge key to success. And obviously, this map is not super detailed, but the entire Hood Canal is about a million points sticking out. So it's a uh, it's it's a pretty fun game to a pretty fun game to play with that. Um, another thing in the fall is as we start losing light, we tend to fish brighter flies, and that probably comes from a little bit of the salmon culture there. But uh, also, I, I do think that a extremely flashy fly works tends to bring more action in the in the fall time. Um, in the summertime, we don't have to do that as much. We're going really natural sand lance colors, um, that olive over green and blue over silver. Um, for herring and things like that, that uh, I think that becomes more and more in the, in the summertime and in the spring. I think that's more important. Um, in the fall, flashy. That's really all we need. Um, the other good thing about the fall is we're fishing shorter leaders. So you can, you know, in the fall, the bait's the biggest you can throw those four or five inch flies with a heavy tungsten bead on, hidden in them. And uh, your, your lines are still gonna, your modern fly line's still gonna turn them over pretty well with a seven foot leader, not trying to stretch it out to a nine and 10 foot leader. Um, in the fall time also, you have a lot of, a lot of, uh, sorry, termites and flying ants landing on the water. When the wind blows and, on those windy days, you'll see like, it'll look almost like a caddis fly hatch on some of the bays and the cutthroat are all looking up, eating those ants and, and termites and it's a ton of fun. Um, there's a huge debate on whether or not they're carpenter ants or termites. I don't really care. Um, I think it's both, but um, it's a great stimulator fly would work, do the trick really well on that. And then as we are entering the winter time, we're fishing a lot of kind of what's there year round. Um, you're always gonna have sculpins on every beach. What, what works in the winter time will work year round. Um, however, the cutthroat, with the exception of worms, the cutthroat really key in, in the winter time on sculpins and shrimp where in the summertime, I think they're really focused on those bigger sand lamps and herring patterns. The things that will give you, uh, the things that will give you more 
more protein, more calories. Um, sorry, one second. Yeah, that bottom, that bottom fly on the slide, um, that that kind of works as an all-around polychaete worm, um, shrimp fly. It kind of does everything. And one of the one of the really awesome features of this thing is the hackle on it. Those long grizzly hackles. Um, we actually we can get them off of a few different animals, but uh those longer like uh I, I i think the probably the most appropriate feather for it that you can get at a fly shop um would be like hen or something like that those grizzly hen hackles um those are those are pretty fantastic in the winter time for representing the little legs on those disgusting polychaete worms i don't know if you guys have ever seen a polychaete worm but uh they're pretty much a sign that aliens do exist and they're pretty pretty disgusting creatures. Um, they look like a centipede that swims. But, um, another awesome feature of the winter time. Sorry, I have to feature Lemmy in every presentation because I do have the cutest dog of all time and he loves to fish with us. Um, <laughs> but uh, my wife makes me put sweaters on him in the winter time when he's on the boat and it's, it works. Um, <laughs> he's a pretty happy guy. But uh, the one of the one of the great features of of fishing in the wintertime, outside of uh, outside of cuddling with my awesome dog for warmth, is uh, the water the water on Hood Canal particularly gets crystal crystal clear in the wintertime um, unless we have like huge rains or mudslides. The water is as clear as it gets in the wintertime. Um, there's no there's no balloons of anything that's clouding up the water like in the summer. Um, and you can actually sight fish for the most part all winter long, um, particularly over the white oyster beds. Um, this beach and this bottom bottom slide here, this beach is, I'm not gonna tell you exactly where it is, but the beach itself is the perfect example of a cutthroat beach. Um, there's a creek right outside of the picture here that dumps in and washes over all these big, you kind of see it in the picture, sort of, that's the best picture I could find for it. Um, you could see the big oyster vein here. The cutthroat will swim along those oyster veins and you could see them on the white, like almost like you're you know going fishing. What was that? I think that was just a un unmuted. That's okay. okay. We're, we're all good. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> um, I prefer you guys interrupt me just for the record, but uh, yeah. So anyway, the cutthroat will swim along those white those white oyster beds, and you could see them swimming across. So in the winter time, we do a lot of sight fishing, which um, extending to a nine foot leader and throwing flies that get down in front of the in front of the fish. It's a uh, it's a really fun time of year to to do it. Um, it's it's probably my favorite time of year to fish outside the fall as the fall kind of blends into winter is definitely my favorite time of year to be on be on the water. Um, so with cutthroat, there is a couple things. The majority of people fishing cutthroat are fishing off the beaches. And I will say probably the most uh, heinous fish handling happens on the beaches of Puget Sound strictly because we have pretty steep beaches full of everything that's sharp. Everything on the beach wants to poke you and cut you and everything else. Everything There's oysters and barnacles and all that. And the cutthroats get dragged up on the beach for photos a lot. Um, it's something that, especially if there's like outings, um, it, is, uh, it is a big thing. Um, one of my clients made me this awesome sticker the don't be a copepod sticker. And if you guys know anything, if you guys have been cutthroat fishing, you know that they're typically, there's a bunch of sea lice all over them. And that's kind of where that came from. Um, but all sea run cutthroat fishing is catch and release and all of it is barbless hooks only. Um, 
everywhere in Puget Sound. So it definitely helps to be like an advocate for these fish. It's such a fun year-round fishery. It would be a super bummer to start getting regulations that are unneeded if people just kind of follow the rules and be cool. Um, and one of my favorite things about Hood Canal is we do a beach cleanup every year where we run our boats up and down the shorelines of Hood Canal all the way from the very bottom all the way to the top and then back down. If we're running wide open at 40 miles an hour, that takes like takes like all day <laughs> to do that. Um, and we pick up trash twice a year. And at the end of the day, we can't even fill our boats. If we do it in Puget Sound, we fill it immediately. Um, but out in Hood Canal, you can't even you can't even get one boat load of garbage um, cruising up and down the shoreline. So if you do see something, it's really nice to pick it up and you know get rid of it. Um, one of the biggest projects we're doing this year is we are with the Coastal Cutthroat Coalition doing the Big Fjord project. This is a uh, this is something I really hope you guys have Greg Greg from the Coastal Cutthroat Coalition out soon. Have you guys had him recently? Yeah, we had him a few months ago. Okay, perfect. Did he talk about this? I don't remember that he did. Does anyone else remember him talking about this? I think he said it was in the works, but I don't think he gave specifics. Like he said, yeah, they had a big so one. So it started. Um, it started the first of the year. Um, what our part in it is you can book trips with us um, this summer. Anytime we have a single angler or two anglers, depending on uh, depending on who they are, um, we don't want to waste people's time. But um, anytime we get anglers on the boat that want to fish with a biologist, we can have a biologist out doing sampling on the cutthroat as we're catching them, um, which is awesome. Um, that is so that, cool. Yeah, it's a project that James Losey and I have been talking about for years. And um, he kept saying, you know, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, and it's here. Um, we're going to be able to do um, sampling. Our goal is to find out when these cutthroat leave the freshwater streams, where they go, how far they're willing to travel. And kind of the one of the biggest questions we have is particularly on the north end of Hood Canal, like from Seabeck North. Um, the water temperatures are the water temperature. The water depth is 800 feet deep. We want to know if when cutthroat leave the streams, if they cross the Hood Canal. Um, that's not like a, that's probably not as big of a question for the biologist, but it's my biggest question of the project. Um, I really would, I would love to know um, that. And there's some places where there is no spawn, known spawning creeks that we catch a lot of cutthroat and we, uh, we want to know where they come from. So we are, we are uh, super excited to be doing this this year. Um, so hopefully, hopefully as people come out this summer, we have to catch six fish per quarter per section of Hood Canal. And we broke it down into eight sections. So we have a lot of fishing to do in the next few months um, or in the next you know, eight, 11 months, I guess, um, to find out where these fish come from and uh, the different and where they go during different times of year. Um, that is our that is our biggest upcoming thing for the year, for sure. Um, and then I mentioned, I'm gonna do a shameless plug here for All Waters Coffee Company. Um, a good buddy of mine um, started out as a customer and he's a uh, special forces guy. And we were talking about like what he's gonna do when he gets out of the military. And he was like, you know, he was talking about all these different things. And he asked me if I did something other than fishing, what would I want to do? And I said, I would want to be in the coffee business. Um, and we kind of kept in touch over the years, fished together a few more times and uh, came up with this idea to raise money for different fisheries projects um, that we care about. And we got, we're, we have 3% of our coffee 3% of the proceeds of our coffee going to uh, save Bristol Bay up in Alaska, Wild Steelheaders United, um, Captains for Clean Water, and the Mayfly Project. Um, and then through all this, we actually 
kind of been working with the Mayfly Project a lot with their um, just coming up with different ideas on how to help kids and get in. Justin, get in. can you, I think folks are probably pretty familiar with the first two, but can you um, just say a little bit about what the second two are? Of course, of course. Um, yeah, so the Captains for Clean Water is a project that a couple fishing guides down in southern Florida got together and started to restore freshwater, um, a healthy freshwater ecosystem dumping into the Everglades and Florida Bay. Um, what's happening in Florida is the sugar industry is growing sugarcane on the lakes that dump into the Everglades. And I'm probably butchering this a little bit, but uh, because I don't know anything about sugar. Um, but the, uh, the sugar industry, when they harvest their sugar, burns off a lot of the plant and it pollutes the water. And then all that water goes into the Everglades and it's killing, it's causing huge algae blooms. Um, a lot of the fertilizers used is causing real issues, but it's, it's causing huge fish kills, essentially, um, killing off a lot of the bait fish down there. The snook, snook are a real sensitive fish to any toxins in the water um, and water temperatures. So when, when all these algae blooms happen, it changes the water temperatures and we have huge die-offs of snook. Um, I'm a Floridian. I love Florida and I love, absolutely love snook fishing. And uh, it's kind of become like a, it's kind of become a project that I've been watching from afar and we were able to hopefully raise them some money um, over the next couple of years. Because um, right now we are just starting the whole coffee business. But yeah. um, and then the Mayfly Project is a awesome, these amazing people started this project to mentor foster children um, and teach them about, take them fishing, teach them about fly fishing, teach them about conservation. Um, and try to catch kids that are, you know, having a hard time and introduce them to like the world of conservation and, and you know, the outdoors, um, you know, you don't, through life's chaos, it's kind of hard to care about like the ecology of a stream, but if that stream gives you some shelter from your chaos, it, it you tend to care about it more, um, I think is the, is the main idea there. Um, but they're the most, they're the most passionate, beautiful people I've ever met in my life. Um, it's been a, it's been like a really awesome deal working with them, um, and their program has been widely successful. So it's something worth checking out, whether you drink our coffee or just check them out. <laughs> um, they have a really fun tournament coming up in May that hopefully you guys can get involved with. Um, yeah. Oh, and by the way, the coffee's super good too, just for the record, yeah. Um, so kind of some of our goals for, uh, and, and things that we're trying to do for 2021. Every year we do, we try to have a big end of the year party. Obviously last year didn't happen. We're really hoping that as you guys are probably really hoping and every, you know, just for the party, obviously you're hoping that COVID wraps up, but uh <laughs> Um, we're going to do a big barbecue as soon as we're allowed to down at Alderbrook and invite, we'll invite everybody from all the different clubs and everything and have a big end of the year wrap up as soon as COVID's done. Um, we do our annual tarpon trip down Florida, as I was talking about, I, we go to my hometown happens to be where they catch the world, where they've caught the last couple world record tarpon on the fly. Um, and, uh, yeah, continue trying to be safe out on the water with COVID and everything. Um, we've been getting all of our guides get tested once a week and um, trying to make sure that we don't kill anybody or get anybody sick. That's uh, kind of a bummer at the end of a fishing trip to find out you get COVID from it. Um, and that's kind of been a reality is a lot of, <laughs> of course I use this picture here, a lot of people don't necessarily want to wear a mask while they're on the water all day. And uh, it has been a little bit of a struggle through the, through the last couple, you know, for the last year. Um, and that's about it. Cool. Thanks, Justin. I do know I flew through that. So please, I'm, 
I would love for any kind of questions or anything like that. Yeah, no, you're you're good on timing. Um, sometimes it's nice to do the stop screen sharing for questions just so that you can see people's faces a bit better. Um, if people have questions related to any of the slides, you can always pop that back up. Um, I'm gonna open it up for questions. I know that um, at least one person in the meeting right now doesn't have a, a mic, so they emailed me some of their questions. Um, so I'm gonna ask those later on um, after a few people have a chance. But um, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask it. If you don't have that capability, you can type it in the chat and we can repeat it that way. Um, but I will open it up. Anyone got questions? I think Steve's on unmute, so Steve's excited. I'm curious about the uh, Big Fjord project and uh, what the, is this WDFW biologists that are going out with you or somebody else? And what it are is, they actually so, gonna do? So there are WDFW biologists um, as well as Hood Canal Salmon Enhancement biologists. I believe they're actually all WDFW biologists, to be honest with you. Um, but uh, yeah, so far, everybody that's been out with us has worked for WDFW. Um, they're doing DNA sampling. Um, mm -hmm. So taking a scale sample, taking a fen clip, um, or you know, a tiny clip off of one of the fens, and uh, measuring and releasing the fish. Um, and they've already, so last year, they sampled all the streams around Hood Canal. Um, they asked us for some input on some of the smaller streams that we think hold fish, and they went and sampled cutthroat out of every stream that comes into Hood Canal. And then they found that every stream has unique DNA. So oh. they're hopefully, as we do this, hopefully we'll be able to find out where all these fish come from. So they're essentially building a, a genetic footprint for each creek or region of Hood Canal. And then when you catch one, like, you know, out in Puget Sound, they can look at it and be like, oh, did it come from one of these creeks? Is that the idea? Exactly. exactly. Um, cool. That's a way smarter way of putting that than what I said. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so- a Way more already, general way. <laughs> yeah, they've already done this for three streams in Puget Sound, um, Kennedy Creek, James Creek, and I'm blanking on the name of the other one. Um, hmm. And they were able to find that you know, some of the cutthroat traveled 40 miles um, yeah. and in the saltwater. So we're hoping, you know, we're hoping to be able to do the same thing out in Puget Sound, so, or out in Hood Canal. So if we, you know, say all of a sudden we're finding that we're not catching any fish in this area, we're able to say, oh, this is this river, we should probably go check out and see what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. See if, you know, there's been a big landslide or, you know, logging project or, you know, something. It, yeah. It's just a kind of a precaution, but also kind of we we don't know how many cutthroat are out there. We don't know hardly anything about these fish. It's the least researched salmonid in America. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. I have a quick question for you, Justin. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed you're using Boston whalers on a bunch of your shots. Um, just wondering if you chose those types of boats for a certain reason because of where you fish or the platform or a combination. So <laughs> um, I'm actually shopping for a new boat right now. So this is kind of a fun question. Um, that The boat that you saw in the presentation is Captain Mike's boat, um, one of our guides, The uh, is the white Boston whaler, Dauntless. It's an awesome platform um super super stable um one of one of like the great things about that boat is you could put anybody in it up on the bow and the boat doesn't move when you shift your weight so from a guiding standpoint you know that you're not going to lose clients off the side of the boat because they step too far to the left or too far to the right um, another another great thing is i mean it's a the boston whaler is such a bomb proof platform that um things don't seem to break on it quite like other other boats like you know my boat is full of random things that are broken from customers thinking that um my rod rack is a foot rest or 
um, things like that. The whaler can kind of take a little bit more abuse than, than the average boat. Um, a whaler and a Grady White are, you know, very similar in that method. Um, also, that boat is from 1994, and he found it with 12 hours on it in Montana and just bought it and put a new motor on it. It's been running awesome. Go ahead, Tate. Yeah, my question for you was um, regarding the fishing north of of creeks or rivers in the spring. Um, is that a, a direction, a true north of them, or is that another term? Um, so I, I say fish north of them. Um, Hood Canal runs north to south for the most part. For you know, maybe not true, but um, I just meant fish towards the ocean from them. Um, when the when the chum fry are coming out, they're kind of beelining it for the ocean. Um, so fishing north of all the creeks and Hood Canal, you will be closer to the ocean than you are. Yeah, you're you're on their migratory path. All right. Yeah. Not, not some, uh, <laughs> some, no, there's, there, there's no, there, there was no, I, I didn't, I maybe, I didn't mean anything literal by that. Oh, no. I can right. just get in front of them. I'm going to jump in with a question from, um, this is a question from Brock. Um, Brock, I'll ask your second question here. Um, I'm reading it verbatim. So, Brock message me or put in the chat or email me or whatever if uh, I get it wrong. Um, it appears that setting the 2021 Puget Sound salmon sport fishing seasons may be a more protracted process than usual. As I recall, in past years, the regulations were pretty much decided by early April at that month's Pacific Fisheries Management Council meeting. This year, according to WDFW's North of Falcon process or website, Draft regulations will be developed April through May and not finalized until June after a May-June public comment period. Is this really different from before or does it just sound that way? I, I think it sounds more different than it is. I think it is a little bit behind schedule, but um, to be honest, that's kind of to be expected with COVID and everything. Um, but I, I believe it's not much different because typically the salmon seasons aren't set by the time the regulations come out anyway. Um, you'll have like a general regulation and then everything changes a month later anyway. Um, that's usually how that goes. Cool, thank you. And then Brock had one more question. Um, I'm not sure if this is in your geographic realm or not, Justin, but in September 2020, beach fishing for coho on Woodby Island was poor in parentheses, I can attest to this. While coho fishing from boats was reputed to be pretty good, any idea why this difference happened? Maybe this happened in Hood Canal too. Um, I will say 2020 was probably the worst coho year we've ever had um, in general. Um, the, numbers, the numbers were down, like the catch rate was way down. Um, and I had a very interesting conversation with another with another fishing guide about this who's more of a salmon charter than I am um and uh they were saying that in 2020 they opened commercial fishing up out of Nia Bay where in the last few years when they said it's going to be a poor return they closed that ocean commercial fishery um and he actually had kept notes since like the 80s on this and every year that they've said it's going to be a poor coho year fly fishing for cutthroat was way easier <laughs> um, because they just didn't open it up for commercial, quite as much commercial fishing. This year, we had a ton of commercial fishing and I think it just made for, it just made for a pretty poor season. Um, that's, that was a lot of that is kind of observational, but uh, as far, if you look back at catch records and everything like that, it, it was a really poor, poor season this year. Um, I actually heard Whidbey was was better than Hood Canal and Puget Sound, and it, and it was, but it wasn't very good up there either. <laughs> um, I don't know if that answered the question or not, but that was kind of 
that was kind of everybody's observation was they had a poor a poor coho year that I talked to, including every fishing guide I know. Gotcha. Thanks, Justin. Brock, I'm I'm watching my email, Brock, if you need to follow up on anything. But uh, anyone else have any other questions for Justin? I'll go again. Um, when you were talking about spring and the transition to summer, it sounded like there was a, a time in there where you're, you're fishing uh, floating lines for um, bait fish near the surface. Uh, and then there's a transition to sort of, you know, sinking lines and, and deep points. Like when normally does that transition take place? So every year is a little bit different, obviously, but uh typically when the water temperature starts to rise um, and the chum fry, once you stop seeing chum fry on the surface, essentially, um, the chum fry, when they're on the surface, the cutthroat don't care about anything else. That's all they want to eat. Um, mm -hmm. You know, on the rare occasion, if, and to be honest with you, usually it's people who are not as good of casters. Um, when when the fish get you know when the fish gets spooked the chum fry will start to spook down if you're casting over them a whole bunch we'll throw bigger flies just to get the fly in front of some fish um mm -hmm. but truthfully i think they're just opportunistic um i i kind of call it like a hail mary oh hey we're gonna throw something big and hope that the fish look at it like a cheeseburger on a on a vegetarian plate um i know you guys are in bellingham so no offense on that um but <laughs> Um, the, uh, the, a lot of those chum fry patterns I use are, have foam incorporated in them. Um, I'll, I'll even put, I'll even tie a lot of them, like the classic Bill Triggs, uh, or Bob Triggs chum baby. And instead of a, instead of a cone head on the front of it, I'll just put a little chunk of foam just to get it on the surface. And, uh, like a, the smallest gurgler you've ever seen. And the cutthroat, the cutthroat will come up and eat it right off the surface mm. just fine. And that sort of till like like May or June or something? Yeah, kind of the end of May is usually when I kind of give up on the surface fishing um, uh -huh. and switch over to switch over to sinking flies and in more of a sand lance pattern instead of a cut there, or instead of a jump fry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Sounds fun. Yeah. So Justin, what's your impression of North Sound? cutthroat fishing um <laughs> i actually i actually i went to college up in bellingham so i uh i i love i love fishing in the north sound um i tend to not be north of camano island though um i'm usually not going any any farther north of that unless i'm i mean coho fishing up there's good but uh the cutthroat fishing i've never i've never really done great north of uh north of meadowdale area um but yeah, I've gone up there quite a bit for bull trout fishing in the saltwater and things like that. Um, that's a lot of fun. Hey, Justin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, would you say that Puget Sound is the premier sea run cutthroat fishery in the world? Or are there other meccas that are sort of like protected saltwater areas? similar to the sound yeah so they do catch cutthroat in the salt water up in alaska um i believe from everybody i know that does it that comes down here and fishes um and i know like three people from alaska that come to washington to fish but um they uh they all they all say it's better in puget sound um there is some oregon fisheries um like tillamook bay has some cutthroat um I believe the mouth of the rogue has some cutthroat, um, but uh, for the most part, I think Puget Sound is, I mean, it's it's the largest trout fishery, like geographically, it's the largest trout fishery in America. Um, so the, I do think it's probably the Mecca for, for cut, sea run cutthroat fishing. Um, I don't think there's a, as far as I know, I'd love to be proved wrong, but I, uh, I don't think there's a better fishery than particularly Hood Canal. Um, yeah, the uh, another place that has pretty good cutthroat fishing is Vancouver Island. Um, 
I, I've been talking to a guy up there for quite a while about about running up and fishing with him, um, just because I just want to check it out. Um, it, he says it's quite a bit different than Puget Sound, but. So South Puget Sound and Vancouver Island, and they just totally skip the North Sound. Sounds good. <laughs> I, well, I actually think there's a reason for that. I think the river systems are help, like, the Nooksack has cutthroat in it. Um, the Skagit has cutthroat in it, and they're pretty healthy fisheries. Like you can go have a great day of cutthroat fishing on the Nooksack and the, the Skagit. Um, the Skagit probably more than the Nooksack, um, from my experience. Anyway, maybe you guys are better at it than I am. But uh, the Skagit is a the Skagit's a great cutthroat fishery, um, and I think there's enough feed between you know the salmon and the salmon eggs and all that. Um, I think there's enough feed in the river where the cutthroat don't have to migrate out to the saltwater. Um, where if you go to Hood Canal, those streams are really steep and really short, and I just don't think there's enough food to to feed all the different all the different trout that are in there. Interesting. Hmm. Anyone else got questions for Justin? Don't see any. Justin, I know you said that this was your, was this your first Zoom presentation ever? My first Zoom presentation, yeah. I think I've, he did, uh, I mean, what do y'all think? I think he did pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I know I, I know I blasted through it. I was a little bit nervous on that. <laughs> no, no, that was good timing and the presentation was good. So my last question then is um, if we do want to book trips for this summer, um, I put a link to your website in the chat, but is there something special that we have to do if we want to book for the Big Fjord project or just a regular nope. day? Give me a call or shoot me an email and uh, we can make it happen. Um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a ton of fun. So um, That sounds really cool. Yeah, and that's kind of our, uh, that's kind of been our, if, you, if we had a slogan, I guess, I don't, we don't really have a slogan. We're it's literally just three dudes going fishing but uh the, the uh our, our thing has always been like we want to have more fun than everybody else that's kind of our goal every day so if we want to if you want to fish with a biologist that's cool if you want to come out and drink beer and have a good time that's that's cool too um, you know, we just want to have a good time on the water cool well, thanks, Justin. This was this was a really good evening and uh, a great presentation. Had a great mix of a um, little bit of a little bit of fishing, a little bit of conservation and environmental responsibility. So I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah, I'll uh, I'm gonna stop the recording and you are all free to go. Thanks, Justin.